Welcome to our screencast on right ventricular dysfunction based around a case complicating pneumosepsis. My name is Max Deschner. And I'm Dimitar Savesky. And we are PGY3 internal medicine residents at Western University. We want to give out a special thanks to Dr. Rob Arnfield and Dr. Michael Satin for assistance with this project. So we start our case with a 77-year-old gentleman who was recently admitted to our ICU uh, from the emergency department for suspected pneumosepsis. Past medical history included type 2 diabetes, COPD, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. And the patient had presented with five days of dyspnea and cough. Initial triage vitals were remarkable for hypotension with a blood pressure of 77 over 63 millimeters of mercury, as well as oxygen saturations of 97% on 40% uh, FiO2 with Venturi mask. And initial blood work did demonstrate evidence of an elevated lactate with a metabolic acidosis, as well as uh, significant renal dysfunction, leukocytosis. The patient's active issues on initial triage included pneumosepsis, and they were started on a number of vasoactive medications, including norepinephrine, vasopressin, and epinephrine, as well as broad-spectrum antimicrobials and uh, steroids. And so an initial lung scan, given the concerns about pneumosepsis, was done. And so here we see the right anterior chest wall view, demonstrating an A-line pattern, right anterior axillary line, demonstrating evidence of B-line pattern, a right costophrenic angle, a demonstrating evidence of dense uh, consolidation, including a dynamic air bronchogram seen uh, near the top right of the screen, and a left plaps view demonstrating as well dense uh, consolidation. So the initial assessment was that the patient had significant anterior and apical subpleural consolidations, dense bibasilar consolidations, more so on the right than the left with dynamic air bronchograms. All of these findings were in keeping with pneumonia causing severe sepsis. And at the time of the scan, uh, the patient's vasoactive medication needs had increased, including norepinephrine 50 and epinephrine 25. And so the question for us really becomes, is this all sepsis? Or is there something else going on causing hemodynamic decompensation. And so with this question in mind, we decided to turn to the cardiac scan and complete an assessment of the heart. Uh, here we are with the apical four chamber view. And right off the bat, one of the major findings here is an enlarged right ventricle. And when seeing this, we really asked ourselves initially, you know, is our probe set in the right position? Is what we think the right ventricle truly the RV? And so here we discuss uh, points of reference to uh, ensure that we are actually at the right ventricle. And our one learning point from this screencast that we want you to take home is that the valve defines the ventricle. And really, uh, this comes down to determining a more apical position of the tricuspid valve compared to the mitral valve. Uh, there are secondary and supporting criteria, particularly for more advanced echo, including the presence of a moderator band, the presence of greater than or equal to three papillary muscles, or three leaflets of the tricuspid valve. But what we want uh, to focus on here is the apical position of that tricuspid valve, uh, which you can see here marked out based on each valve. And that's a very telling feature and can help you really determine that you truly are at the right ventricle. Uh, other features uh, that we noticed here were that the right atrium and left atrium both appeared dilated, which was suggesting to us that this could be more of a chronic process. And here is a more RV-focused view of the apical four chamber. So here we have the parasternal long axis view. Uh, and one point to note is that the right ventricle dilation is not as striking as it was in the apical four chamber. And we'll turn to that in a moment to discuss one tool that can be used to help assess the relative sizes on the parasternal long axis. So with all of that in mind, our initial points of thought are, what is the LV size and function and what is the RV size and function? Qualitatively, the left ventricle appeared relatively normal, with an ejection fraction perhaps around 50 to 70 percent. We have not shown all the views, but based on our limited views, we could not identify any significant regional wall motion abnormalities. We use the LVOT VTI, or velocity time integral, to determine the stroke volume. As we know, this is a surrogate for stroke volume. Uh, needs to be, of course, averaged out in our patient who has atrial fibrillation. Based on a stroke volume calculated around 45 milliliters, we were able to determine using our calculation uh, written out here, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate, that the cardiac output was roughly 6.3 liters per minute of relatively normal range. 
and our listeners can refer to the Western Sono Stroke Volume Determination and Pitfalls of LVOT VTI screencasts for more details on how to determine these findings. When faced with a low stroke volume, uh, questions we always ask ourselves are, one, is this uh, secondary to a suboptimal preload? And two, is this secondary to suboptimal contractility? Uh, and this helps us delineate causes of shock, including hypovolemic and obstructive shock within the uh, finding of suboptimal preload and cardiogenic shock under suboptimal contractility. And thinking about our dilated RV here, we really honed in on whether this could have been secondary to obstructive shock. Now here we want to discuss some of the tools that can be used to assess the RV size. In our case, we thought that qualitatively our RV appeared severely dilated, which to us suggests RV dysfunction or overload. And some helpful rough parameters that can be used are that a normal RV is generally less than two-thirds the size of the LV. A moderately dilated RV is roughly equal in size to the left ventricle, and a severely dilated RV is greater than the left ventricle. Yet there are pitfalls when uh, using the apical four chamber view to complete this assessment. And so here we show just some different examples of how the RV size can appear different based on where the probe is actually sitting. Looking back to the uh, parasternal long axis view we had earlier, we can talk about the rule of thirds, which is that the right ventricular outflow tract, the aortic outflow tract, and the left atrium should all be roughly the same size on the parasternal long axis. Or it was less apparent uh, in our case that the right ventricular outflow tract was grossly uh, enlarged relative to the other two chambers speaks to the fact that you cannot rule out an abnormal right ventricle using this tool because you're only seeing part of the right ventricle. So RV shape and function is a second uh, facet of assessing the RV and can be very helpful uh, depending on what view you're in to determine if what you're seeing is relatively normal or abnormal. Uh, from the apical four chamber perspective, a normal RV should generally be triangular in shape. Abnormal RV, as we saw with our case, uh, might look circular or more ovoid. The parasternal short axis should show a rough, uh, generally crescentic RV, uh, whereas an abnormal RV would look more circular. And here within image D, you can see that crescent shape. And then finally, the apex of the heart should generally be occupied mostly by the left ventricle, whereas an abnormal apex would have more of a component of the RV taking it over. And that was certainly the case with our uh, apical four chamber view, where the RV seemed to be really taking over the apex relative to the left ventricle. Here we see the parasternal short axis view for our patient with evidence of interventricular septal bowing, which we'll discuss uh, in a few moments, but just appreciate the more circular shape of the right ventricle relative to what would, should normally be a crescentic shaped right ventricle. So, so far we have discussed that this patient's right ventricle certainly looks dysfunctional and it looks like there's also been a change in size, and we wonder whether or not this is an acute or a chronic phenomenon that's contributing to these findings. So furthermore, we're going to dive into the pathophysiology of RV dysfunction in the acute setting and what mechanisms lead to acute right ventricular failure. Kind of starting off at the top, so initially you get a RV pressure overload, which may lead to dilatation, and decreased contractility and subsequent RV dysfunction. And this has some downstream effects. So what may happen, we can get tricuspid regurgitation and pulmonary regurgitation in the chronic term. And in the acute term, as the RV gets more volume overloaded, you start to develop things like increased right atrial pressure and right central venous pressure, which subsequently lead to signs of systemic vascular congestion, such as elevated JVP and pedal edema as well as hepatic congestion. And these things in and of themselves can lead to organ dysfunction. In addition to this, with the decreased contractility and RV dysfunction, there may be an, an decreased RV output and altered systolic or diastolic ventricular interdependence, which can cause a decreased preload, uh, as Max alluded to earlier, and this can lead to decreased cardiac output as well as hypotension in the shock-like state. And the last part of the pathophysiology being that increased RV wall tension can increase oxygen demand, decrease coronary perfusion, and this can subsequently lead to arrhythmias, RV ischemia, and certainly worsen the amount of injury and inflammation in the RV, potentially worsening the contractility and RV dysfunction further.
terms of the causes and differential diagnosis of acute right ventricular failure, certainly this is a broad differential diagnosis. The biggest ones to keep in mind is acute pulmonary embolism, exacerbation of chronic lung disease or hypoxia, acute lung injury, sepsis, pericardial diseases, or coronary artery disease, or right ventricular infarct. So these are some important etiologies to keep in mind for investigating some of these patients further. So hemodynamic consequences. So the big takeaway here is that RV systolic dysfunction can lead to low cardiac output and can either cause in cardiogenic or obstructive shock-like state. So the causes of low stroke volume in RV dysfunction or the mechanisms will be named below. So the first would be a synchrony of the ventricles. So RV dilatation causing RV systolic dysfunction and delaying RV systole. So what can happen is the systole RV is delayed and as the LV is still filling, the RV may still be in systole. So this may decrease the stroke volume and subsequently lead to hypotension and shock. The second issue that may happen is from RV dilatation again is septal shift which subsequently may compress the LV and cause decreased stroke volume. And last, in acute RV dilatation, what happens is the RV takes more of the pericardium and decreases the distensibility of the LV, subsequently decreasing LV filling and causing a decreased stroke volume. Interventricular septal flattening is something we have already mentioned. So the normal LV cavity is typically round-shaped throughout the cardiac cycle. Uh, in patients with RV overload, the LV can appear D-shaped due to septal flattening, and this may be due to either volume or pressure overload. So pressure overload typically is more visible in systole, while volume overload is typically more visible in low pressure in diastole. So differentiating between pressure and volume overload is limited in a POCUS setting. However, an EKG may be used in order to determine when the patient is in systole versus diastole. So this is just to highlight the same concepts again. As you can see on the left-hand side, the left ventricle is quite circular in the normal heart. And on the right-hand side, you have RV volume overload leading to a dilated RV and subsequently get a flattened septum and increased pericardial constraint leading to a D-shaped left ventricle. Again, we're moving back to the ways in which we can assess the RV. This time we will be talking about the peristernal short axis. This is a peristernal short axis view of the heart, showing that the LV has a D-shaped configuration, which is likely as a result of either pressure or volume overload from the right ventricle. In here again, we have uh, more images showing, showing this uh, exact phenomenon where the LV looks to be kind of in a D-shaped configuration if you look at the C and D pictures and that it's be the septum is being compressed because of the large right ventricle. So now we will touch on more quantitative metrics that are used to assess the right ventricle. Things we can look at are the right ventricular systolic pressure, the TAPSI, uh, the TVS prime, fractional area of change, ventricular interdependence, and the mean pulmonary artery pressure. We won't discuss these in detail, so these are uh, beyond what will be discussed in the screencast today, but just some things to keep in mind and to read about for the POCUS keeners out there. Uh, next, we will talk about another view to assess the RV. This is again either in the peristernal short axis or in the subcostal short axis, uh, viewing the aortic valve in the right ventricular outflow tract. Uh, so here we have this view. As you can see at the bottom, we have the aortic valve and subsequently at the top kind of Closest to the probe, we can see the pulmonary artery in the pulmonic valve with uh, some color Doppler across the pulmonic valve. And here is somewhere we can put pulse wave Doppler through and potentially look at PV acceleration and subsequently calculate the MPAP. Again, we won't be discussing this in detail, but these are just some measurements that can be done. So this is just a picture of some color Doppler across the valve to determine whether or not there's any large pulmonary regurgitation. In terms of differentiating acute versus chronic RV dysfunction, there are multiple signs we can look at. For example, the RV wall thickness, the RV systolic pressure, or RVSP, RA dilatation, which should be more present in chronic RV dysfunction, and the 60-60 rule, which essentially states that if the pulmonary artery systolic pressure is less than 60 and greater than 30, with an acceleration time less than 60, the 60-60 sign is considered to be present, and this is 94% specific for acute 
whole pulmonary due to acute pulmonary embolism. Next, we have a image of the tricuspid valve and continuous wave Doppler through the valve in order to determine the patient's RVSP. Um, so this, with this, we can calculate the gradient across the valve and add the right atrial pressure, which will help, which will help us determine the right ventricular systolic pressure. Now moving on in terms of management, so this is a step-by-step -step process from the AHA guidelines in determining and evaluating RV dysfunction and the subsequent management of RV dysfunction or right ventricular failure. Certainly we would start with a clinical evaluation, so looking at the blood pressure, the patient's mental status, uh, whether or not they're undergoing any diuresis or their fluid balance, a biochemical evaluation, looking at their lactate, liver enzymes, renal function, BMP, and troponins where available, looking at imaging, so for example, the POCUS findings that we mentioned, or CT scan if we're concerned about a pulmonary embolus, and look at invasive evaluation, so central venous uh, gases, or in some cases, pulmonary artery catheterization uh, to look at hemodynamic variables and values. The next step would be uh, looking for underlying causes, rather, sepsis, arrhythmias, uh, or triggering other triggering factors such as RV infar infarction or pulmonary embolus. Subsequently, it would be optimizing a fluid balance. So it is certainly not as simple as giving everyone fluids in RV dysfunction. It would be evaluating whether or not the patient is overloaded, such as our patient, and that may, they may need IV diuretics or renal replacement therapy if sufficient or if they have no renal function, and subsequent to that, using pressors. So the, to maintain arterial pressure, the recommendation is to use norepinephrine, and then considering inotropes to reduce cardiac filling pressure, such as dobutamine or phosphodiesters 3 inhibitors, such as milrinone. And subsequently, for our intubated patients, what we can consider is inhaled nitric oxide or inhaled prostacyclines, and consider transferring them to tertiary centers for either ECMO or mechanical circulatory support. So our clinical impression of this case was that this patient had severe RV dilation with moderate to severe RV dysfunction. There was interventricular septal flattening throughout the cardiac cycle, so both systole and diastole. And in the setting of low stroke volume, we thought this was consistent with a component of obstructive shock and RV pressure volume overload. So our recommendations were volume removal to offload the right ventricle and hopefully improve the stroke volume, to consider a CTPA or empiric anticoagulation for a possible pulmonary embolus, and considering agents that can improve inotropy in pulmonary vasodilation, so either milrinone versus dobutamine, and consider inhaled nitric oxide as we mentioned earlier. Something else we recommended was to consider reducing positive pressure or PEEP in order to reduce the afterload on the RV. The conclusion of this case was that there was fluid removal, so the patient was on CRRT, aiming for a negative 100 cc's per hour. The team subsequently weaned epinephrine and started treating the patient for PRE empirically until hemodynamic stability could allow for further investigation with CTPA. And on repeat POCUS, there was visually improved RV function with less dilatation, which we will show in the next slide. So as you can see, this is again the a repeat Parasternal short axis of the same patient in the LV configuration is no longer D-shaped. It's taken more of a circular configuration, likely indicating that this patient was in an element of volume overload, and with the volume removal, the LV can generate a better stroke volume and is taken on its normal configuration. So a few key takeaways from this case for us. Uh, the first was that the RV is an exceptionally challenging cavity to assess. And there are a number of pitfalls involved in both the qualitative and quantitative assessment of its size and function. That said, there are many tools, as Dimitar uh, expanded on earlier, uh, which are available to the point of care sonographer to give a truer picture. And I think it's up to the POCUS enthusiast to determine in real time what tools are available and best used at the bedside to help solve a particular clinical question. Uh, this case was a great opportunity for us to think about acute versus chronic RV failure on ways to delineate these two processes. And finally, this case was an excellent reminder of the intricate structural and functional relationship of the RV and LV uh, as we expanded on in a number of the interesting images, particularly interventricular septal flattening and some of the effects on hemodynamics, for instance, preload.
Thanks for listening to our case, and we hope you got something out of this that you can take to the bedside to help you solve your own clinical questions going forward.